Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G, and welcome to Health 360 with Dr. G. Today's topic, men, be true to you, embracing healthy masculinity. Masculinity is a hot topic these days, but the different expectations for what being a man entails can often leave men feeling lost and confused about how they should act. Starting from childhood, boys and men are often called out for behavior that doesn't match society's definition of manhood. Unhealthy or toxic masculinity involves cultural pressure for men to behave in stereotypical ways. Conversely, healthy masculinity is important on both individual and societal levels from a health standpoint. So what is healthy masculinity? To better understand healthy masculinity, it is helpful to start by looking at it from two angles, why it's important and how masculinity becomes toxic. We'll be talking about this and more today on Health360 with Dr. G. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez, Dr. G, board certified internal medicine physician practicing out of Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle and Medicine. Check me out across all the socials at health 360 G, and check me out on my website at health360podcast.com. Grab a pen and paper, y'all. We're in for a treat. But before we meet my guest, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast, is for your information and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So I want to introduce my guest today, my first third time guest on Health360 with Dr. G, just a longtime friend colleague, and we've had so many deep, meaningful discussions, and I had to bring him back on, and so I want to introduce my longtime friend and colleague, Todd Fink. Let me read you his bio, his credentials, because his credentials run deep. Todd Fink is a certified alcohol and drug counselor at Linden Oaks Behavioral Health. He's an artist and TEDx speaker. He's also the host of the Kind Mind Podcast. Todd, welcome back to the show, my friend. Thank you, Dr. G. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and yeah, three times Three times is a charm, and I'm grateful for our longtime friendship and yeah, all the deep conversations we've had have been very meaningful. So happy to be back. Thank you. Oh, well, hey, I can't wait to get granular with you on this. It's <laughs> such an important topic. You know, Todd, every comic book hero has their origin story. Give us a little bit more about where you grew up, uh, how you got into your field of training, and why is this topic important to you when you help clients, especially men, try to be the, become the best versions of themselves each and every day? Thank you. Yeah. Well, like you said, I wear a number of hats uh, from the clinical side, working as an addiction counselor at Linden Oaks for a couple decades now. Can you believe it? I know. it's. Crazy. And I started out in psychology and music in school at Georgetown. So I've always been having engaged with these two professions, art and music and uh, psychiatric work. And I've lived in a number of places as well. I was born in California, grew up here in the Midwest, a little bit more in Indiana as a smaller child. And then I went to school on the East Coast. I did some study abroad in Europe. I lived in Asia studying yoga and meditation. So that also connects to my interest in masculinity because I've had these different perspectives. And I gradually came to realize that different cultures, different generations, different time periods, and different wisdom traditions have different takes on the meaning and the, the depth of, um, of power behind these concepts like masculine and feminine. And I found that it's, it's both helpful in my personal journey towards understanding myself, but it's also been helpful in treating patients and helping people understand who they are, what their natural strengths are. Uh, what the cultural influences are and how we can be better to ourselves and to each other. And I think this energy, this, this concept of polarity, masculine and feminine, just like light and dark day, night, summer, winter, and so on is a fundamental part of the balance of life, not just human life, but all life and in nature and in the universe. And there's so much wisdom to draw out of this. So, yeah. Well, Happy I'm to go deeper excited. into any of these ideas. I know. I'm just so excited that we can continue to have this conversation. And when we think about the time that we're living in, I, I would say it's it's needed now more than ever to have these conversations, to have men be okay to open themselves up 
to experience the full range of emotions that make men better men, husbands, fathers, brothers, sons, you name it, uh, professionals. <laughs> it's almost yeah. like the, it's almost like it goes on and on. Right. Right. And I couldn't agree with you more. This, this time, I mean, I think every generation feels like they're really at the edge of history or at a very pivotal moment. And it feels that way now, but with the advent of all the technology and the social media, it's both revealed unhealthy patterns in society and culture. And it's also complicated things. It's also created new kinds of challenges for us too, on the mental health front. But given the, all the, uh, the collective trauma that people have been through the last few years with pandemic, with inflation and economic uncertainty, widespread inequality, yeah. society has never been more fragmented in, in my time. But at the, at, at the same token, we can use this as an opportunity to build some bridges and to really start to heal past wounds to understand ourselves better and and build bridges to to community and a renewed sense of um you know common well-being common good excellent well there you go everybody you met todd fink again if you've been checking out the show health 360 with dr g for all the episodes i've had again this is your third time here in todd so there you go you have it so here's how the show works i'll ask todd some questions of course, he's going to give me some awesome answers. I'm going to participate <laughs> as well, too. Uh, uh, I want you to grab that pen and paper, you know, something about writing it down. I got my pen right here. Again, I love this pen, health360podcast.com. I got one. But, and I love it. And I also have to just say I love this coffee mug as well, too, health360 with Dr. G. But something about when you write it down, creating those neuromuscular pathways, and then empowering you to be the best version of yourself. And if you have questions, of course, don't be afraid to speak up. Talk to your doctor, talk to your mental health counselor, just talk to somebody uh, who will listen to you in a non-judgmental way. So Todd, when people come into the office, we call that the chief complaint. So the chief complaint is this, what is healthy masculinity? Why is it important? And how do we encourage men to be their true selves instead of being confined Two stereotypes. So here's the first question for you, Karen. Let's start with a couple uh, couple statements. So here's the first one. Todd, please finish the following statement for me. Here's the first one. Mm -hmm. The phrase toxic masculinity or unhealthy masculinity is best defined as? Well, unhealthy masculinity, I think we mean by that that there is an attempt to use aggression or um, power to dominate someone else or to coerce someone else or to harm someone else. But oftentimes a person does that to gain control. It's a, um, you know, an unhealthy attempt to deal with an emotion that a person either isn't aware of or doesn't have the emotional intelligence. And I want to draw a distinction between masculinity and men, because we all have, all people have access to, masculine qualities if we think of masculinity as part of a spectrum of energy and of course when anything goes towards extremes you you can get things like violence and um and trauma so i i also prefer sometimes to use unhealthy masculinity because we're quick to assign all the blame to a particular person behaving badly we've seen this over the years in addiction dr g where we used to attribute so much of the behavior with the disease of addiction to a moral failure. But then we've learned how the brain has a defect and how it can be a disease of choice and that there's other factors like childhood trauma. It's over 70% of addiction patients have childhood trauma. So when we say toxic masculinity, I think it's good to, to use that as a placeholder for identifying all the different influences that contribute to that. So we don't take the the easy way out and just say, this is a bad person. And we hold uh, families, cultures, societies responsible for changing the status quo. If there are bugs in the system, we want to be able to discover those and uproot that. So would you say, Ty, what it's like, you know, it's not just a single, you know, all in all defining phrase of toxic masculinity. There could be even, it could be even more, um, just not as singular as it is. It could be more broad and compassing. I think so, because, I mean, it's no, 
it's not controversial, I don't think, to say that we live in a patriarchal society, which means that historically more power has been on the male side, not just not just in terms of financial and political influence, the, the roles that men have played, but in the family, in, in the household, the, there's often that, um, that imbalance. So it's really hard to say uh, what, what it would be like growing up in an environment that's totally different than that. It's, it's, there's no counterfactual for us right now. However, in other species, we see that the, there are different roles for male, um, male animals and they're not all the societies in the animal kingdom are constructed the same way that that we do with with the way our hegemonic groups play out um like a in in the ant kingdom there can be a queen ant i'm particularly fond of the seahorse dr g because <laughs> it, historically this has been a symbol of good luck and masculinity yet when you look at the life of the seahorse the male seahorse has a pouch and the male carries the eggs of the female and is deeply involved with what we would see as raising or rearing children. And yet there's a, there's an acceptance or there is um, a, a certain kind of gentleness to the male seahorse because it doesn't have feet and legs like other mammals. It has to trust currents and the ocean and the, the cycles of nature to be able to move and operate. But I think there's a lot that we can learn by just studying other species and see that, okay, masculinity is also a construct. So if it's a construct, and when this construct has been taken to extremes in the family, in society, it contributes to violence, it contributes to inequality, it contributes to mental health challenges, both for men and women, because it's complicated being a young a young man in today's society trying to figure out okay how do i not fall into patterns that could be considered toxic uh and especially if that's the the information coming from previous generations and at the same time find my true voice and be able to honor like as you said in the beginning to honor what's authentic about us yeah i think about how a great example with the seahorse because when you're breaking down those the stereotypes of of men and and the, the the qualities, the strength, the leadership, the courage, but at the same time, in that example, the seahorse, nurturing, compassion. I mean, those are those are amazing qualities that can help men that that are that are innate. That, I mean, that's innate. That, that's I mean, right. Yeah. When we think about masculinity being energetic, energizing, yeah. strength. Um, leadership, yeah. we can we can protect ourselves from becoming unhealthy with that when we use those for goodness. It takes strength to be honest. It takes strength to be vulnerable. It takes strength to go first, to take the risk, to take the hit. Um, it takes strength to lead, to to serve, to be to put yourself. Um, in the service of others, to sacrifice, to make a sacrifice for the well-being of others. All of that, I think, is a, is a demonstration of masculine qualities that, um, that we have access to or that men can, uh, can utilize. And, uh, and, and in that way, they can avoid you know, some of the stereotypical traits that, are, that can be toxic when, when a person is trying to control or expressing anger in a toxic way so many times with emotions like anger or hurt or sadness we call it an emotional reaction somebody shouting somebody throwing something but really yeah, very if you look carefully it's an emotional rejection yeah. by shouting at this other person or by becoming aggressive it's really a denial of what i'm feeling it's like saying, I can't feel this right now and I need you to change or I need to have control over the situation so I don't have to feel this way. Mm -hmm. But real emotional maturity means not just feeling better, but getting better at feeling. So that might look like tapping into some of the feminine energy, which could be something like self-awareness, patience, compassion, going inward, 
taking time to tune into oneself and then re- reconnecting with that masculine side, being able to express that, being able to to share, to to tell uh, the truth of your heart and be able to ask for what you need. You got it. No, this is awesome. Todd, let's get a definition of, here's the last, last statement that we're going to get into some awesome examples. Okay. But uh, Todd, let's do this one. We just define toxic or or unhealthy masculinity and that it's just, it's not very singular. It can be so much more involved in that. But let's yeah, do the layer. converse in, in, the, in, the, in the kind of the traditional definition, the converse of that being healthy masculinity. So here's the phrase, here's the, here's the statement, finish the following statement. The phrase healthy masculinity is best defined as? Healthy masculinity to me is when we use our natural strengths to be of service, to be good to ourselves, to be good to others, to take care of one another. And that strength isn't to gain control. It isn't to dominate. It's to lead. It's to serve. It's to make sacrifices. Oh, that is a great thing. And again, there's examples time and time again of people that have really been part of something bigger than themselves, putting them, putting right. others, helping elevate others and still being 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 perceived as masculine could true to the greater good which is great so thanks so tyler to one more kind of compare and contrast yeah. if you kind of say um what are some of the the qualities like the traits of toxic versus healthy what kind of comes to mind if you had to kind of just say you know again singular but there may be a little bit of and maybe some overlap or some things that are gets more of a continuum as you said but if you still had them as singular entities what would be some toxic traits and what would be some healthy traits? Sure. The, the unhealthy traits would be shouting, yelling, aggression, um, controlling, manipulation, even more subtle aggressive patterns like uh, sarcasm, the silent treatment. Um, these indirect ways of trying to manipulate. So any, any attempt to manipulate emotionally, physically, verbally, or otherwise, to control other people. That, you know, this is really the the ill of society. And the reason why I would call that toxic, if I were to call that toxic, is because I think it negates or denies a fundamental truth about nature, and that is interdependence. That when we try to control this isn't just a problem in an individual with their mental health. This is a problem in society. When mankind tries to impose its will on the earth and the future, we don't realize that we're harming ourselves. And there are different scales. Obviously, when you try to control your loved one, uh, you can see the effects of that right away and it can deteriorate the relationship right away. I think in society on collective levels, it takes time and we're starting to see that play out. So it's kind of the, um, the reflection of some of these deep patterns that have existed for centuries. So Todd, let me ask you this, uh, you know, it's interesting when I think about the, the things that, that are just so, um, again, defined as toxic and things as healthy, but there are health challenges. And I think about it from a health perspective, there are health challenges related to toxicities. And I think about one of the biggest things is that uh, a lot of men that may, that may have characteristics of toxicity, as far as their masculinity, they don't go to the doctor as often as men that actually do. And of course that translates, as you can imagine, into things like, um, you know, no physical examination, which can mm-hmm. lead to lack of diagnosis of conditions like diabetes or heart disease, which can put somebody's risk at stroke or heart attack or cancer. So they don't even they don't even enter the health system as opposed to men that truly have those those right. qualities uh, of healthy uh, masculinity. Correct? You're seeing that. Yeah, and I'd like to add on to this, Doctor G, because I think yeah. you'll find this interesting. I've been curious about some of those discrepancies in men's health and women's health particularly the underreporting, because men are, are much less likely to go to the doctor. But there was an interesting study done in the UK that showed after retirement, uh, there is no gap between reporting between men and women. So it, 
it suggests, and, and further studies are suggesting that men underreport, not just because of something like toxic masculinity or um, trying to be stoic, even if they may have something going on, mm-hmm. but because of other cultural pressures to not take time off work. And now we're seeing this is a problem, not just for males, but for people across the board in America, we use on average less than two weeks of vacation a year. So you could say that in terms of work, there's something, uh, there's some toxic masculinity in the way we expect everyone to be productive. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's why it's important. I think when we're talking about toxic masculinity to look at all these factors. For me, I see a lot of veterans, and this is another example, men who are older than you and me have either been to war or had fathers who had been to war. Yeah. And what war does to people, the the, um, the traumatic environment that, that we put men in throughout the, the history of the United States and the history of the world, and expecting them to come back and have the all the tools. It's just so sad in our country that we have so many homeless veterans and thousands upon thousands of Vietnam veterans with full-blown PTSD 40 years later. So, uh, but yet at the same time, when people can get into treatment, you're right, Dr. G, when we, when we can reach people, there is so much hope. I, I mean, I've recently worked with multiple veterans recovering from addiction and learning about emotional intelligence. And I got to tell you, it's some of the most rewarding work because I think people, people don't want to suffer. And that's one thing that we can all agree on that, that people are hurting. And when we look at, at everyone's health on a multidimensional level, it takes us a little bit out of the blame game of people and helps us look at, at systems. Another interesting point here is that males commit suicide three times as much as as females. So this is one of the leading causes of death for men. And this affects everybody because we, you know, even when we when we, you know, know that there can be so much frustration with inequality and gender inequality, we still love people. You know, people still love their sons and love their partners. And to and and I'm getting calls all the time, my brother, my father, my son is struggling or had a suicide attempt or has an addiction. So this is something we all have to look at, but, but why, why is it that high when females, the prevalence of depression in females is three times as much. So you have men committing suicide three times, but experiencing one third of the depression. So there's some disconnect there coming back to what you said originally. Yeah. Um, and it really, that really speaks volume with the stigma that's attached to it. Right, it speaks to stigma. But if we think of suicide yeah. as the terminal case of depression, mm-hmm. how is it that there's that gap as well? Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of things to unpack here to be able to help people and communities heal. You know, Todd, it reminds me of a story when um, I had a gentleman in my practice years ago, and it was his first time visiting me. And I actually met him at a um, men's health uh, kind of a church group when I did some volunteer work for a local church. And uh, the words that I said, and I kind of started out by just saying to the group of gen- gentlemen, it's about probably 20, 25 gentlemen in the room, probably between the ages of 45 and 75, and and a decent amount of re- recent retirees. And so this gentleman that saw me was a retiree, recent, hadn't been to the doctor in a long time, but I got him into my office, which is great because I said, and this is the words that I said to, to the men, I go, you know, men, uh, statistically, our, our, our spouses are going to outlive us statistically. And I kind of told him, I go, listen, you know, uh, it's very common that men, once they finally get that chance, they worked so hard. They had this, what I kind of call this John Henryism, uh, where you're so stoic, you work hard so long and so hard, and then disease starts to fester. And then, of course, not till you retire, you say, okay, now I'm going to finally pay attention to myself. I'm going to do it now. I never mm-hmm. had the time for all this time working my, my butt off, but now I'm going to do it. So anyways, uh, the gentleman comes into the office, make a long story short, he brings his wife. And she goes, at one point, she goes, Dr. G, I brought him in because if he has something and he dies, he knows that I'm going to take that life insurance policy. I'm going to get me a red Audi S8. And it was, it was just kept going on. And I was like, whoa, whoa, we got, we got to take a break. You know, uh, Time out. I just want to connect with him. But it was amazing that she had a plan. 
But it got the guy thinking, though, that um, really got him. And he's actually been a longtime patient of mine who has followed me to my current practice and is really engaged in health. So there you go. Sometimes you just never know when it happens. You never know. I have seen, you know, miracles. And it's just it's just a matter of connecting with people. So many men have never had the tools to express their emotions. And there are stereotypes with different emotions between different genders. So when a man, there's, there was a study where men are expressing certain things in the office place, and it's perceived as strength or leadership. And when women are expressing the same sentiments, it's perceived as difficult or oppositional. So women are quick to be perceived as crazy or we have derogatory misogynistic words that don't have counterparts for males. Um, and then on the flip side, in, in the in toxic, more toxic environments, being softer or crying or feeling sadness or feeling lonely are difficult feelings for men to express. And they may have actually been bullied for feeling those things or even expressing love. It's very hard for, for some men and young men to just be able to tell um, another friend, another male friend that they love them or that they care about them because of different stigma around that side of the emotional uh, rainbow, if you will. So you're joining us here on Health 360 with Dr. G. I'm sitting down, chatting, having a great discussion on the topic of masculinity, uh, toxic versus healthy with Todd Fink. I want to do a section, Todd, where I'm going to call compare and contrast. Okay. So what I'm going to do in this session, I'm going to say the example, and then you're going to state whether that is an example of toxic masculinity or healthy masculinity and why. So here we go. First one, I like this. When a boy cries and his father tells him to toughen up or that men don't cry, toxic masculinity or healthy masculinity and why? Well, it, it definitely can be unhealthy because when we bottle up our emotions, they don't really go away. I like to say, I mean, I don't like saying this, but I use the analogy of a landfill. When we stuff, we build a landfill in our heart. We need to learn and be able to teach young men how to compost your feelings. It takes time to feel things. And it takes courage to be open, to be honest, and it takes trust. So there are difficult, more difficult emotions for different people. And that's what we're here for, right? In, in healthcare, to be able to help people process those feelings and to be able to accept and uh, make peace with their story. Right. Here so much of the sense. healing journey is just a matter of self-acceptance. I mean, you, you hit it right there. As you mentioned a little bit earlier, let me take it back on that one. As you said, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. And, you know, when we think about when we're confronted with grief, uh, you know, that sto- being stoic, can really take away from us really experiencing our grief and letting ourselves be be okay to feel okay okay to feel not mm-hmm. well kind of thing. I think you know what I'm saying. But but it's like it's like we have to do it. We can be of deep emotional beings because we're human. And as I'm going to quote one of you, you said we are not robots at one point. I remember that years ago I was talking. You're like we are human beings, not human robots. I think I'm paraphrasing it. Human beings, not human doings. We're always, ah, that's we're always trying okay. to distract ourselves, <laughs> workaholic, uh, you know, yes. foodaholic or, or whatever it is to, to get away from our feelings. But you know what? Uh, uh, Dr. Brene Brown sa- said this well mm-hmm. one time. We can't selectively numb our feelings, even though we may want to just numb sadness or numb hurt or numb fear. It really cuts us off from feelings like gratitude, joy, connection, love. And that's why when this becomes a maladaptive way of coping through stuffing or drinking or isolation, it's hard for men to be emotionally available in relationships. And so this is why we want to help people heal from this or protect them from from some of those maladaptive patterns. Appreciate it. Here we go. Next one here. I like this one. Treating women and girls with the same thoughtfulness with which they like to be treated. Unhealthy or healthy masculinity and why? I think, yeah, I think healthy. Anytime we're being thoughtful and trying to understand what someone else's experience is, being empathic and being able to treat Mm -hmm. them in a way that respects their identity, respects their authenticity. Is, is empowering for all. Excellent. Let's see this next one here. I like this one, Todd. 
when a man tells his partner what they can and cannot wear and who they are and are not allowed to spend time with, would that be an example of maybe unhealthy or healthy masculinity and why? Unhealthy. So, yeah, I mean, th this is an example of what I was talking about with the definition in the beginning, th these attempts to control. I'd, I'd invite people to reflect on this, that if you really love somebody, you give a lot of freedom. Um, now, there's there's some different manifestations of this in different kinds of relationships. Obviously, you can't give total freedom as a parent, but but it's not even in a, in a parental relationship, it's not about control as much as it is stewardship. The, the discipline that might be there in the family for a child is only because of the vulnerability of the youth. And in all of our relationships, what we're really protecting in one another is the other's individuality and the other's freedom. It's basically like to to be a strong, healthy, masculine figure means that you're defending the rights and the space of either the women or the other people that are in your care. You know? So that that's the way I think of it. And, uh, and if we can remember that, we can still feel as though there's a warrior spirit in us. If, if that's where we draw our inspiration or we draw our masculine power from, but the warrior is inspired by love, uh, interested in knowledge and wisdom and using that to protect the freedoms of everybody in their circle. And so we'll do a couple more of these. I like this one. Um, uh, here's a statement and then we'll do a compare and contrast. All right. I like this one. Developing as emotionally available caretakers and parents to both boys and girls. Is that an example of unhealthy or healthy masculinity and why? Healthy. Yeah. So absolutely. when we can be emotionally available, it teaches emotional intelligence. Emotions don't need to be so scary when we come to realize they don't last. We all have different moods, just like there's different weather. And there is a different way to respond depending on what the mood or the weather is. We're so quick to get up in the morning and check the forecast. Why? Because we want to know if we should follow through on our plans or if we should make different plans or how we should dress. Similarly, it's, it's healthy to take inventory of our mood every morning. I have no idea what mood I'll wake up in tomorrow, <laughs> but it will say something about yeah. what I need to do to take care of myself, but also be mindful of how I'm going to treat others in that kind of internal environment. Excellent. Let's do two more of these. I like this one. Okay. Here's the next one. Uh, and you can probably guess where, where I'm going. I got a little pattern going on healthy, healthy, unhealthy, and healthy. But again, this is important that we're, that, that we're talking about just keeping it real, so to speak. We want, yeah. I want, you know, you and I were talking today and want men out there that are listening to know that um, we, we feel you, we hear you. We've been there. Um, you're not alone and we're not judging at all. So here's the next one. All right. I like this one. Here we go. I like this one. When a man is afraid to be emotionally vulnerable with his partner for fear of seeming, seeming weak, healthy or unhealthy and why? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that, that can be unhealthy because the weakness is lacking the courage to be honest this is something i think that all people can struggle with at any given time it can be it can be difficult to open up to tell the truth about who we are to be forthright about our true preferences um, i think this happens a lot of times in relationships at least in the beginning we're trying to audition for each other or or prove that we're worthy partners. And then if we create a persona that that doesn't really match what's true for us on the inside, then then it's hard to bridge that gap. But I think that this is how you have healthy boundaries by being real, being authentic, telling the truth of your heart. And then you get to know how much trust is there in the relationship when we're not opening up when we're not and this goes for all people, not just men, but when people aren't able to express their preferences, 
then we never really know how much the people in our life respect our boundaries. So by being open and giving a little bit of our internal life, we build trust. We get to see how people use that. We make something important to us, vulnerable to the actions of someone else. That takes courage. That's a masculine quality to be able to put that out there. Um, but, but holding back uh, just so that you can please somebody or again, manipulate the situation or control the situation then that becomes unhealthy. I'm not saying it's easy, though. Yeah. It's a practice. It's an it's art. practice, yeah. Mm-hmm. So here we go. Let's do this last one. And I'll kind of preface it like this, Todd. You know, we know that the impact, uh, the impacts of unhealthy masculinity and healthy masculinity are far reaching. So here's a statement that tells which one this is. Using their privilege as men to advocate for women and others, healthy or unhealthy masculinity and why? I think it's healthy. Um, We all fall somewhere. I mean, in my, in my view, we all fall somewhere on the spectrum of privilege. And as men, we may not immediately recognize that, that it is a privilege to be a man, to be a male in a historically male dominated world. How we deal with that is, you know, is, is where we're at today. But um, there are so many other types of privilege, the time of birth, the place of birth, the family that you're born into. We have what we think of as a totally free enterprise capitalist system where people, uh, there's no constraints of how much, how industrial you can be, Right. But for the most part, if you divide the socioeconomic classes into five, no one from the bottom quintile goes to the top quintile. It's very, very rare. And if you look at the health or the lifespans even of a man in the bottom quintile compared to a man in the top quintile, it's almost a 20-year gap, Dr. G. This could be one of the strongest predictors of premature death. So we need to look at all these types of privileges, uh, white, male, um, and the socioeconomic class that you're in. For somebody with healthy masculinity, they take inventory of their privilege and they equate that with a sense of moral responsibility. The greater the privilege, uh, the greater the call of life to be of service, to give something back. I appreciate you. And, you know, it's interesting. We were just at a lecture talking about just in our service area of our health system that when you have, and of course our health system has expanded uh, across, you know, a pretty fair amount of, of Chicago and suburbanite Chicago, but we're looking at the most vulnerable communities. You're right. The 20 year life expectancy difference being in the inner city or being up in the North suburbs. I mean, or out in the Western suburbs, it is real. And using that privilege to advocate for others is powerful. And then I'm going to quote a line and then we're going to paraphrase again. I'm not, we're pretty, pretty, I'm not good at it because I already messed up the one paraphrase that I said for you, but with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, yeah. um, Spider-Man, AKA Spider-Man's uh, yeah. uh, uncle. Uh, I think that's what it was. Yeah. So, so we're uh, echoing that right. sentiment. We, we have to do that. And the time to act is now. The time to advocate is now. So I want to transition to something that we do on each episode of Health 360 with Dr. G called Miss versus Facts. And we're talking again about the impacts of healthy masculinity versus unhealthy masculinity can be far reaching. So it's important for us to set the record straight so we can get rid of any misconceptions that are out there and allow ourselves again as men to be able to experience the full range of emotions that are our authentic selves. So here it is, Todd, first statement, you know how it goes. I'll say, I'll say the same, you say myth or fact and explain, here it is. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go out of order, so I'm gonna mix it up, here it is. All right, men must be big, brave, and strong. Myth or fact, please explain. Myth. Uh, I mean, we can't control, uh, to a great extent, we can't control our height, you know, and, and some of our, <laughs> some of our structure. I mean, yeah. we can, we can do different things, yeah, but, um, but masculinity doesn't look a certain way physically. I think it, 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 it can have features like that, but, but mostly what we're talking about today is 
the attitudes of health, the, the right energy to bring to the dynamics that we find ourselves in, in society and family and work and so on. Excellent. Here's the next one. I like this one, Todd. This one's for you again. With the fact, please explain. I like this one. Men are emotional, even if they are not in touch with their emotions. With the fact, please explain. I think that's a fact, Dr. G, yeah. because we that's are all programmed with biological drives. I don't think people realize this, but to a great extent, our emotions are another level of helping us survive. Emotion, the word comes from French, emovoir, which meant to move. So we get happy because something is uh, nourishing or, or uh, feels good, or the relationship is protective and loving, and we get joy and gratitude because it's our emotional immune system saying, yeah, more of that. And we get frustrated or angry or sad when we lose things that are healthy for us. So our emotions are always saying something deeper about our survive, our biological drives. And the biological drives, you don't have to teach. You don't have to teach a baby to fall asleep or to put something in its mouth, <laughs> right? So, so we don't always understand that. And therefore, it doesn't matter how stoic you are. You still need to eat. You still need to sleep. And you're going to feel things when those survival instincts are challenged or threatened or uh, fulfilled. Wonderful. Here we go. I'll take this one and I'm probably going to have a Todd think back up on this one, but here's the statement. Okay. Uh, myth of fact for Dr. G. Please explain, Dr. G. Here we go. Talk to myself. Healthy masculinity means being honest with oneself about your own feelings, needs, and desires. And I will say that as a fact. And here's the deal. Uh, men need to have a healthy or balance, or healthy, I would say healthy and balanced sense of masculinity. And there's not just one quality that defines masculinity for men, or one quality, maybe if we're talking about the opposite, as, as stereotypically as feminine. The reality is that people, us as men, us, us as people, women, everybody has characteristics that that travel across the continuum there. Again, abilities or, 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 or characteristics are much more fluid in that, and that actually would make us better people. Todd, your take on that one? Yeah, I, I agree. I think we all have natural strengths and weaknesses and gifts and preferences. I had just the unique experience growing up being the captain of the football team. That would be traditionally right. that. <laughs> a pretty masculine uh, like role in high school. But I also played music and wrote poems and continued to do that. So I, I think it's healthy when men feel as though they have wider range of healthy expression and, and also the expression of their identity and get to calibrate uh, these energies with gender and identity and, and the expression of it in a way that's authentic, but safe and respectful of others. All right, here we go. I like this one. Here's a statement. Myth of fact, please explain this for you, Todd. Unhealthy or toxic masculinity may not allow males to fully express themselves and their emotional needs because people may view it as a sign of weakness or vulnerability. Myth of fact, please explain. Yeah, that's a fact, right? Yeah. I mean, um, and there are different reasons for that. I was reading a book called The Mind Body Code by Dr. Mario Martinez, and he points out how shame is an archetypal wound. We shame each other when we make somebody to believe that they are inferior. Friedrich Nietzsche had a really powerful quote in one of his books that the real harm of shame is that a person doesn't get to become what they truly could be, like the acorn never getting to experience being the oak tree, because it believes that it's limited. So without realizing this, when we when we shame people or when certain men who maybe are part of a more toxic culture shame a boy for feeling a certain way or for not doing the things that would be stereotypical of men or young men. And it makes somebody believe that they're not capable of being what they are. Uh, that's the, the real injury. And so that's why it's important to understand this so that we can help people be able to support their family, be able to create safe space for people, non-judgmental space, and be able to respect one another. And as, as family members, I think it's our responsibility to nurture and create an environment where your loved ones can actually blossom, 
whatever that looks like. We don't want a garden where every single vegetable is exactly the same or a flower bed where every single flower looks the same. But we have to take care of that space so that the people in our life have room to grow and change and create and expand. Wonderful. Let's do one more of these misresses facts. I like this one. Um, this is a this is a really good one. Uh, boys of all, we haven't talked much about pediatrics, but but I, I do want to make sure we say something related to adolescents. But here it is: boys of all races and ethnic backgrounds who don't act masculine enough may be subjected to harassment at school. Myth or fact? Please explain. Sadly, it's uh, a fact. I I seen it. I was never. Uh, this is something that I've had to grow to understand. I didn't know throughout my life, throughout my childhood, how to really not bully and protect people from being bullied and be able to see some of those harmful patterns. So this is a growing process. But when I said before the archetypal wound, that means you you can hardly find a race or a culture or a time period where there wasn't shaming of men. I mean, shaming of anybody, but but there there were particular ways that men could be shamed. If they didn't meet the criteria for passing a a ritual into adulthood, Um, if a young boy couldn't defend a herd of sheep from, from an attack from a lion, then he can never become a man. There are stories like this throughout history in all cultures, shaming stories. Uh, So, so that's really what, what we're up against when we don't understand this or when, when we don't do what we can do to uproot bullying, we got to really help our kids understand this because from what I, I mean, I have a distorted perspective working with kids in the hospital because I hear the worst of the worst of the stories, Mm -hmm. but it really breaks your heart to hear how unhealthy and how toxic it can be at school for certain kids who don't fit the normative uh, uh, patterns and are ostracized for it. One of the most painful traumas is abandonment, abandonment or rejection. Because again, coming back to the biological drives, we're all wired for companionship. I don't think that will change too quickly, but in this technological society, it's getting harder and harder to connect as it is. But it's, it's wired into us because otherwise we would not be at the top of the food chain. Mano y mano, we don't stack up against other predators. We don't have claws and tough skin and all that. But when we become friends, when we become companions, we increase our biomass. And that's how we have survived. So whenever that's threatened, it can be really harmful to the psyche. Appreciate it. There you have it, everybody. This versus facts. So we have about five minutes left. And this has just been just really, really good conversation uh, talking about uh, healthy masculinity. What is what does it mean, and how can we continue to improve on our our destigmatizing masculinity and really helping men really experience the full range of emotions? So, in the beginning, we called it the chief complaint. In the end, we call it the assessment and plan. And that's when somebody, if we're finishing with our clients, we give them a diagnosis, we give them a treatment plan, and most importantly, importantly schedule a follow-up. So Todd, give it to me. Give me a few take-home points uh, for people that have been listening to the show today. Take-home points, action steps for men to really take that step to okay to be and tell them that it's okay to be vulnerable to experience emotions. How do we, what are some take-home points, action steps for men that are listening to the show? Oh, thanks, Dr. G. Uh, yeah, I think some simple things that men can do can be to start to get in tune with your emotional side, your psychological side. I think some simple practices like writing down about things that you feel, keeping a journal, keeping a gratitude journal, writing yep. down things gratitude. that you're grateful for will just get people in tune with how they're feeling and what's going on in their life and how it affects them on different levels. You can also start to notice patterns, seasonal patterns, uh, things that trigger your past. I think it's also good to try to practice being a little bit more open, taking steps to build trust with the people in your life, to let people who love you show you that what's vulnerable to you is safe with them. And if it's not, then, you know, then that, that's a different story. And not being scared to reach out for help, to connect with professionals when you might find that you don't know how to connect with that side of yourself or that you're suppressing feelings that are really hard to make sense of 
because of trauma or because of war or because of abuse or because of the way you're taught to suppress certain feelings, maybe in the family and, and taking steps towards that, reaching out because there is always help for us and the society is changing, you know, and there's a lot more resources out there than ever before. And I talked to men all the time, you know, from, uh, from all different backgrounds. And like I said, you know, war veterans, even who are just like, I didn't realize that, that I could do this. So, so there's always hope. And uh, there's always people like Dr. G or myself that, that are, are ready to have your back. Help we you absolutely out. are. Well, thank you, Todd. And before we get to my final thoughts, let me do a section here, an acknowledgement section that we do on Health 360 with Dr. G called the Listener Healthy Oh Yeah Content. So here's a quote by a loyal listener, BB. My grandchildren are grown, so I have them over for dinner and we talk. Well, thank you for sharing your story, BB, and we really appreciate it. And you out there, I genuinely love hearing your stories. And if you have a story with your permission, I'll read it on the show. And who knows? Your story may be a catalyst for someone else who needs to hear it. So my final thoughts are this. Men need to have a healthy and balanced sense of masculinity. Research shows that most men don't personally agree with real men stereotypes, but unfortunately, many men go along with the expected attitudes and behaviors because they think most other men endorse them. What this means is that most men support a fuller range of human emotions and behaviors. There are many ways to be a man. When men acknowledge this reality, are encouraged to be their true selves instead of being confined to stereotypes and embrace healthy masculinity, this allows them to take care of themselves, recognize when others need help, care for others, and contribute to a more respectful culture for everyone. So I want to thank my guest today, Todd Fink, Certified Alcohol and Drug Counselor at Linden Oaks Behavioral Health, artist and TEDx speaker, host of the Kind Mind Podcast. Check it out, y'all. I've listened to plenty of those episodes. Todd, thank you again for being my first three-time guest on Health 360 with Dr. My G. My pleasure, Dr. G. You're a great friend. <laughs> I'm proud of all the good work that you've done and, and happy to, to play a small part. And, and it's so thank you. You said it so well. There are many ways to be a man. I love that. Yes, and yes. and I also want to remind people to take up mindfulness and meditation. It'll really help you tune into your inner life. Wonderful. Thank you for being part of my village. Thanks a village. You're part of my village, brother. Hey everybody, you, you've been, hey, everybody, my pleasure. You've been listening to and watching Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and video production specialist is Mike Paskey. Copyright 2022, Edward Elmer's Health. All rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health360podcast.com and follow me across all the socials at health360wdrg. This is Dr. G signing off. And until next time, peace out. 